Good afternoon, everybody, and hello. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs in Dublin. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar. And we're truly delighted to be joined by Stefan Auer, Associate Professor in European Studies at Hong Kong University. Professor Auer will discuss the challenges relating to Europe's eastern border in a time of war in Europe, amongst other things. Professor Arrow is going to speak for approximately 15 minutes, and then we'll go to Q&A with you, our audience. Professor Arrow will use some slides at the start of his presentation. As ever, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screens. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we'll come to as many of them as possible once Professor Arrow has finished his address. And finally, by way of housekeeping, a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. I'll now formally introduce Stefan Auer and hand the floor over. Stefan Auer is Associate Professor in European Studies at the University of Hong Kong and an expert on nationalist movements in Central Europe and crisis governance and management or mismanagement within the European Union. Some of his major works include European Disunion, Democracy, Sovereignty and the Politics of Urgency, published by Hearst in 2022, and Liberal Nationalism in Central Europe, published with Routledge in 2004. And this book was awarded the prize for best book in European studies by the University Association for Contemporary European Studies, UACs, the leading academic EU Studies Association in Europe. Professor Auer, of course, has written widely on European affairs for the likes of the South China Morning Post, the Australian and CNBC and elsewhere. I'm really looking forward to this timely discussion. Professor Auer, thanks very much for being with us. Thanks for being back in virtual Dublin, of course. It's a shame you can't be with us in, in person, but I guess this will do. And the floor is yours for the next 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Barry, for your kind introduction. I'm flattered. I'm humbled. I'm honored to be invited. It really feels like a return to Dublin. I have very fond memories of, of Dublin. It's uh, where my academic career started at University College Dublin, the Dublin European Institute, back then headed by Professor Bridget Lafan, later uh, Ben Tonra, both excellent colleagues and friends. I could not have wished a more amazing start to my academic career. So very fond memories and a great honor to be uh, with you and with your uh, guests. So Hartford, thanks to Dr. Barry Colfer, Colfer and Alexander Conway for uh, invitation and organizing this. So this is a return of sort, even if only virtually. In fact, it was almost exactly 20 years ago that at UCD we organized a conference on, on a similar topic, reclaiming the future, the Central European quest. That was at the time of the Nice Treaty and EU enlargement, of course now the EU faces a much more challenging enlargement and much more challenging Central European quest, which is what I want to uh, discuss. And uh, can you see my slides? Uh, Very well, yeah, all good. Yeah, because just a year after that, I was fortunate, lucky enough, to, to have uh, met uh, Václav Havel, who also features in my lecture uh, today, and uh, Seamus Heaney. Uh, that was... Uh, uh, a, a very nice event. The, the, Václav Havel was awarded uh, the, from Amnesty International Ambassador of Conscious Award and, and the Laudatio uh, was presented by, by Seamus Heaney. And this takes me uh, to my book and the topic of this uh, talk, right? European uh, Disunion. I want to talk about finding Europe's eastern border, the European Union in times of war. That means that I will start pretty much where I uh, finished. Uh, my book. I was fortunate enough to be allowed to write a short uh, afterward, like author's note, uh, about 10 pages at the end uh, of the book uh, that was a month after uh, the invasion. But most of the actual book is, is written uh, before uh, February 24th uh, this year. And yet I believe that the number of issues that I discussed there, and I'm looking over the uh, I'm looking at the uh, decade of crisis that the EU went through, that the number of those issues became even more uh, per pertinent. But in this talk, I want to, to talk about Central Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, and what challenges it poses to the EU. Uh, 
now. So until quite recently, people in Central Europe, and if you are wondering about my accent, it comes from Czechoslovakia, the Slovak Republic. So until quite recently, people in Central Europe had just one desire, not to be a part of Eastern Europe. That was the Central European quest. That was also one of Hubble's key aims. And one of the questions I want to ponder now is whether that quest was accomplished at the expense of Ukraine and maybe even at the expense of, of Russia, whether another options were there and other paths that were not taken and, and might have been more, more uh, fruitful. So the EU's challenges now, of course, are, if anything, even more formidable than 20 years ago. The first challenge is more imminent. The EU needs to find a way to offer Ukraine continuous support, right? Continuous economic support uh, and, and also support to enable its, its victory. But Europe and Ukraine's problems won't be over once the war is over. The second challenge is thus formidable too, and that is to live up to the promise that the EU has already formalized of EU membership. What is also not clear, of course, is what is to happen uh, to Russia. So in that way, I'm going to talk about yet another return of Central Europe, a topic that kept me busy for the last 20 years and that kept me busy also when I lived back in Ireland 20 years ago. In fact, I tried to convince everyone who would listen that Ireland too was a part of Central Europe in a, in a peculiar way, which I hope to explain. So this is the, the book that I uh, 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 derived from. And, and it is uh, something of an accident that the colors of course now invoke also the color of, of Ukraine. But as I said, I believe that a number of issues that I raised there are very much relevant to the current uh, challenges. It is uh, about sovereignty, uh, democracy, and the politics of emergency, more, more than ever, of course. Uh, and the book finishes on a poetic note, partly because I struggled uh, to make sense of uh, what is uh, yet to happen, right? So it finishes uh, by, by excerpts from the poem by Czesław Miłosz, a brilliant Nobel Prize winning Polish poet and an essayist, and it's quite kind of uh, 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 telling that the poem that he wrote about 1945, the end of the Second World War, speaks to us uh, today. And particularly the lines I, I cited as, as the last words of my book, that's the beginning in a sense of my presentation. In the fine capitals, they still like to talk, yet the 20th century went on. It was not they who would decide what words were going to mean. And that is the perspective of an ordinary uh, soldier. And that to me just uh, reinforces the kind of situation we are in uh, right now, that it is uh, the outcome of the war in Ukraine and the people of Ukraine fighting that war who will have a decisive impact on where Europe is going to be in years and, and uh, decades uh, uh, to come. I also found it moving that the Seamus Heaney, whom I, whom I uh, started with, uh, wrote uh, about uh, Václav Havel, back then the Laudatio, but also about Czeslav Miłosz. He had a love affair with Central Europe. He praised, he praised Czeslav Miłosz as someone who was tender towards innocence, as tender towards innocence, as he was tough-minded when faced with brutality and injustice. And this is, in a sense, to my mind, the challenge that we Europeans face uh, in response to Russia, right? Can we live up to our ideals and can we defend our ideals in a way uh, that would, that would uh, provide Ukrainians with sufficient uh, support? And so this is uh, what takes me back to this Central European quest, to this tragedy of, of Central uh, Europe. And this is uh, the idea when I said that even Ireland is, is in some ways, in terms of its uh, historical experience, a central European nation. So I'm talking about uh, an influential essay by Milan Kundera, which I discussed to some extent in the book, The Tragedy of Central Europe, in which he, he defines a small nation as one whose very existence may be put in question at any moment, a small nation can disappear and it knows it. And he talks about Central Europe as that uncertain zone of small nations between Russia and Germany which represent the greatest variety within the smallest space. And he contrasts that with Russia that was founded on the opposite principle, the smallest variety within the greatest space. And he goes on describing Russia really as a different kind of uh, 
civilization. He went into a lot of trouble for that description, actually. Uh, I mean, he, he received a lot of criticism. Uh, he, he writes about Russia as, as a country, as a nation that knew another greater dimension of this disaster, another image of space, a space so immense, entire nations are swallowed up in it. Another sense of time, slow and patient, another way of laughing, living and dying. Again, it's kind of strange to be rereading that essay in the context of the current war. It is strange to see Kundera vindicated in a sense. And Kundera's uh, suspicion of Russia, not just the Soviet Union, Russia uh, vindicated. And that is the suspicion that of course many Central European elites, including political leaders, including people like Václav Havel who, who were opposed in many ways uh, in, in, uh, on a number of issues against uh, uh, Kundera. Uh, they, they shared that, that awareness, that concern uh, uh, with Russia, but, but that was not equally uh, received uh, in, in, in the West. So in the West, uh, uh, of course, including in Ireland, in my experience, uh, uh, people looked uh, frowned upon what they perceived as the rational fear that Central Europeans had uh, against Russia. So let me just fast forward towards the more recent history and the predicament that we find ourselves in, in now. And, and I want to illustrate through two pictures, one of the key points that I try to advance in, in my book and, and a, a point that is, I think, uh, relevant to the situation that we find ourselves now with respect to, to uh, Ukraine. So starting where I finish my books. The 24th of February this year, of course, marked uh, a, a radical break, right? Whether you call it Zeitenwende, as the German chancellor uh, described it or, or something else, it was a, a radical uh, break. The Russian full-blown invasion of Ukraine is dramatic break, which forces us to examine our assumptions about Europe, politics, power, and, and, and violence. And my book is a polemic against the view that we live in a post-conflictual, post-political world, against the idea that through interdependence, we can solve all the problems that we have. I think uh, Ivan Krasyev actually observed that early on after the invasion, that Europeans deceived themselves, believing that interdependence that worked within Europe, Franco-German reconciliation, etc., could be easily exported outside of Europe. So in relation to Russia, and I would argue even in relation to China, that approach has its limitations. And my book is a polemic against that. When Mark Leonard published his book, Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century, that was about 20 years ago too, he did not mean to suggest that Europeans would revive their imperial dreams of domination, but rather that Europe found a way to move beyond the world of great power politics and domination. And we know now that that was not to be, right? The soft power Europe as a model for global governance has lost a lot of its credibility through this conflict. And I think there are two pictures which perfectly illustrate the tension between the aspirations of that soft power Europe and the reality in which we live now. If you want between the Europe that the likes of Mark Leonardo or, or Andrew Moravchik, whom I could also discuss, celebrated and the one we ended up having. So this is the first picture. This is the revolution of dignity, the Maidan movement. I love this picture and I've been using it for the last uh, eight years in my teaching here in Hong Kong, uh, teaching European studies. Because what we see there, right? There is a, a flood of uh, Ukrainian flags, but in the middle of these upheavals and, and, that, and that revolution of dignity, right? by current standards, was, was relatively nonviolent. Uh, the regime murdered more than 100 uh, protesters, but by the standards of the current war, it was relatively nonviolent. You see in the middle of the picture, the EU flag, representing Ukrainian aspiration to return to Europe, to reclaim its rightful place amongst the advanced, prosperous, stable, liberal democracies 
of, of Western Europe, right? Now, fast forward eight years. This is a picture for, from Verkhovna Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. And what do we see there? And what is missing? We see the Canadian flag, the British flag, the Czech flag, the Polish flag, the United States, NATO. The one that is missing, conspicuous by absence, right, is the EU flag. There is no German flag there either. There is no uh, French flag, right? So where was the EU at the time of the invasion? The picture is just uh, three weeks uh, before uh, the invasion. Uh, but, but days before the invasion and shortly after the invasion, the EU was nowhere uh, to be seen, right? And I'm not necessarily upset by it, right? Of course, the EU has no military capabilities and uh, neither should it have military capabilities. Uh, the Ukrainians were right to, to see that they need support from the US, from NATO, from the nation states of Europe who are willing uh, to support them. So uh, there's nothing to, to be mourned as, as, as such. But for me, what these two pictures represent is that the EU, the soft power Europe was strong enough to, to motivate uh, the democratic forces in Ukraine to fight for democracy, to fight for their place in Europe. But it was not strong enough to uh, protect Ukraine against an aggressive, against a revanchist uh, Russia, right? And this is what I would describe borrowing from Kundera, a Ukrainian tragedy of Central Europe, right? So then the days after the invasion, the EU uh, was nowhere to be seen. A German government took a couple of days to declare Zeitenwende, the consequences of which we are yet to see. Joseph Borrell then tried to overcompensate for uh, the lack of decisiveness by promising days after the invasion that the EU would supply Ukraine with weapons, even fighter jets, he said, only to disown that promise a, year, a day later because, of course, he had no authorization by NATO or, or Poland or the US to, to send fighter jets to Ukraine. And to this day, uh, they were not sent there. So rather than dem demonstrating EU's power, the bold announcement exposed Europe's relative impotence. In a similar way, Borrell responded more recently to Putin's reckless remarks, threats to resort to nuclear weapons by promising that the Russian army in Ukraine would be annihilated in response. Now, who is Borrell, right, to make such promise? Does he have an army under his command? He's often referred to as a foreign minister of the EU, but we of course know that he is no such thing because the EU is not a state and he does not have a foreign minister. Borrell is the high representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. So this is, to repeat, what I would describe a Ukrainian tragedy of Central Europe, that this in-between political entity that the EU is, has created an in-between status for Ukraine, which Putin's Russia was quick to exploit. Whatever the evolving aims of the Russian invasions, uh, invasion are, at their core, it is an attempt to turn Ukraine into, you know, just, just an in-between region that they can dominate. Tragically, too, that is the actual meaning of that Slavic word, Ukraine. So what Russians want to do is to turn Ukraine, a sovereign state, into the Ukraine, the borderland, which is the meaning of the, of the word in Russian, in Polish. So instead of becoming a part of the EU and NATO, Ukraine had to accept an inferior status within the EU neighborhood policy and also as being a semi-permanent aspirant for NATO membership. In many ways, this brought about the worst of both worlds, that they were in this no man's land, right? In this blurred in-between world. So repeatedly, the EU's soft power was strong enough to inspire Ukraine to fight for democracy and freedom, but not strong enough to deter Russia from the invasion in 2014, then again in 2022. And that criticism is, of course, valid uh, uh, towards NATO to some extent, uh, but that's not my uh, focus. So that makes me think, and this is, I'll, I'll finish basically on an open-ended question that is very much my next uh, research agenda. That makes me think whether we need to think differently about the success 
of the post-1989 EU enlargement? Did the Central European vision of a return to Europe succeed too much in a sense? Was it accomplished at the expense of those left behind? In other words, getting rid of the East European label for the countries of Central Europe, including my homeland, right? I'm delighted for Slovakia to be doing so well. Meaning getting rid of backwardness, instability, and chaos that characterize the region. That did not do away with Eastern Europe as such. The border dividing the world of political stability and prosperity just shifted further to the East. Finding Europe's Eastern border for the European project now is a more formidable challenge. To address it, we need to be bold asking difficult questions about what went wrong. Was it a mistake to pursue both conflicting goals at the same time, which is something I am discussing. I, I, I did discuss in, in, in the book, you know, EU deepening and widening. My hunch is that that was a mistake. It is worth remembering that alternative plans were considered. Gorbachev talked about a common European house, a concept that I, I was very dismissive at the time, but it was there, right? And it had some, some supporters, some credibility. The French also pursued some ideal of confederation that didn't go anywhere, but uh, they had in mind that they would create something that would encompass the whole continent. And Margaret Thatcher, of course, and I'm not going to gain many friends uh, citing Margaret Thatcher, but Thatcher uh, advocated a speedy enlargement at the expense of, of deepening. In fact, she was uh, hoping that through enlargement, the Federalist agenda uh, would be subdued. None of these scenarios gained sufficient support. But this is not to say that the EU, which we currently have, is the one and only worth having. That is, I believe, the delusion of retrospective determinism, which is a term uh, coined by Timothy Gatto Nash, and I, I strongly support that, that concept, right? To see how we best address Europe's future challenges, we should be open-minded about analyzing past missteps. And I think that we should uh, think again about, about uh, 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 that solution that was found uh, uh, back in the 1990s, uh, that the EU went ahead with both deepening and widening. I think that the number of problems that Europe currently has, including the Eurozone crisis, that is not, not uh, uh, gone. Uh, yet, in, in my view, uh, can be traced back to the Treaty of Maastricht and that decision that was taken that uh, to make Europe viable, it had to be deepened uh, before it expanded. And so it worries me that right now, when we face a, a bigger challenge of enlargement with the promise made to Ukraine to bring it in, similar logic seems to be uh, inspiring uh, leading politicians like Olaf Scholz, suggesting in Prague, of all the places, that the unanimity requirement in foreign affairs and security policy uh, should be abolished. So uh, I think that the German uh, dominant attitude to Europe, whatever uh, the question, more Europe is the answer, is, is not uh, very helpful. If I was to summarize uh, the key argument of my book in, in one sentence, it is a polemic against this widespread uh, assumption about the EU captured by the metaphor that Walter Hallstein, I believe, coined that the EU is like a bicycle that uh, you have to move on. It has to advance towards an ever closer union, towards more integration for it to succeed. Uh, I would just conclude by saying that the EU is not a bicycle and we can do better than that. Thank you.